What do you think, Jennifer? Should we get started? You're on mute, but I think you said, I think you gave a thumbs up. Wonderful. Well, I will, uh, I will dive in. Hopefully everybody can see my screen and uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We're excited to uh, talk tonight about our Beltline redevelopment project and uh, I will kind of kick things off and run through a quick presentation with a handful of slides of kind of where we're at today and then we will uh, turn it over to Jennifer Munson to talk a little bit about the city process and then we'll leave plenty of time uh, for any questions or comments at the end as well. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned at the beginning, this is also being recorded as well, so we'll make sure to uh, post this afterward uh, for everyone to see. Uh, we've got a handful of our team members here from the Opus team uh, joining tonight. Uh, my name is Nick Bernan, I'm with Opus Development. Uh, presenting with me tonight will be Dean Newens, our head of architecture and design at Opus AE. Uh, we also have uh, Tim Callahan from our uh, Opus Design Build Group. Uh, we've got Kit Bennett and Anna Bodie from our development group and Theo Grove from our uh, design group as well. So uh, with that, I will kick things off and run through our presentation. Uh, jumping into our slides, our first slide, there we go. Uh, just getting everyone oriented with the project location. Uh, the site is located on Beltline Boulevard between uh, Park Glen Road and West 35th, just about a block south of the new Beltline Southwest Station. Some project details. Uh, the project team is made up of uh, our three companies at the Opus Group, Opus Development, Opus AE, as well as Opus Design Build. Uh, we are working with a handful of uh, consultants on the project on the front end. We've been working with Kimley Horn as our civil engineer. Ron Intertech is our geotechnical consultant and Wank for our environmental. Uh, again, the project is located at 3440 Beltline Boulevard, uh, consists of 250 units of mixed use transit oriented development. The project is made up of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and a handful of live work units, which reside on the first floor of the project along Beltline Boulevard, adjacent to our retail space. 10% uh, of the units will be affordable at 50% of the area median income or AMI. It is a five story project with 330 parking stalls in a dedicated ramp above grade that is for the residential portion of the building. And we also have 7,700 square feet of commercial space with about 5,500 square feet on the north end of the site and about 2,200 square feet on the south end of the site. We also have a 27 stall uh, surface parking lot, which is designated for the commercial space uh, on the north end of the site, which you'll see in the site plan that we're going to jump into here in the next slide. Um, I can kind of get everyone oriented here and then I can turn it over to Dean Newens uh, to talk a little bit about the layout and the design of the site. But uh, this is our first floor site plan. And as you can see, Beltline Boulevard sits at the bottom of the page and West 35th Street is at your left. Uh, north would be to the right of the page towards the uh, light rail station. Um, we've color coded the differences between residential amenity spaces, retail, green spaces and parking, uh, which I will turn over to Dean to walk through in more detail. Great, thanks Nick. Good evening everyone. Thanks for taking the time in your evening to join us and let us share with you the project that we're really excited about uh, for this site. As Nick mentioned, this is a transit oriented development. Um, we're about a block from the future station. And uh, in that, um, it's really about that connectivity between this site and, and that station. Um, this is a unique site. It's uniquely shaped. It has adjacencies that are unique to the preserve. Uh, north is essentially, let's say, to, to the right on the page. Um, that's back towards the station. As you um, think about the the project to the east across Beltline Boulevard, um, we have this beautiful uh, wetland preserve and um, outdoor um, open space, which becomes a great neighbor for folks that are living there. And uh, in this trail connectivity that's gonna run through the site, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this uh, 35th Street is really the gateway into this, what is now a, a commercial and industrial area. And that is, um, let's say our front door, our formal front door for our residences. But the way that we conceived this site was really to take the best parts of the site from a, um, a natural landscape and honor that 
and, and try to build and integrate around that. So starting at the north end of the site, you can see the site really tapers uh, down to a point and there's beautiful um, green space there and, and vegetation. And so we wanna leave that alone to the extent possible and then work our, force our development and influence it towards uh, 35th Street and Beltline. Uh, the St. Louis Park has a, a really strong code that helps influence the design of the project. And it's really about taking the design and pushing it to the edge of the street to activate the streetscape and to create energy along the streetscape in this mixed use environment. And as Nick mentioned, um, we're kind of uh, barbelling the project with retail at each end because this um, we wanna take advantage of the green space that is at the north end of the site and have an activated experience for both residents and neighbors at this end of the site. And so you'll see this green box that is about 5,500 square feet of retail and then an outdoor patio space that's adjacent to that. And this idea of, you know, um, being outdoors, as we all know, with what we've dealt with in the past year, that that's very important. And um, to the opportunity that really becomes an extension of that retail and, and activates that street street safe, as I mentioned. Then um, at the other end, the other barbell, the other retail is really holding the corner and giving you that more traditional retail space. If, you know, many of the neighborhoods around the area have uh, retail on the four corners. And, and so we're really um, being, uh, let's say, inspired by that. And this small retail space would be more of a service retail at that end. Now, what connects these two um, areas is the, the, the energy. Um, I might say that uh, working with the city, we understand that this, this uh, dark gray line that you see running along Beltline is really, it's, it's called a trail easement. And it's really an expanded sidewalk and, and it's intended to create connectivity through the neighborhood, but also to create a relationship to our building. And so there are really four things that are happening along this, um, this streetscape. First is the patio and retail area I described. The yellow space that's the amenity space is really our club room and fitness for the project. So that's another area which is really creating activation on the streetscape. Then the darker blue are a couple of units that are, let's say, more traditional in that they have windows um, and they're accessed from the hallway and they have windows that face the street. But then just past that to the south, are the live work units that Nick described. And these half a dozen units really are walk-up units and they have porches out front and they have stairs that access. We also have access from the, from the backside for, for the residents. But the idea that these could actually be used as artist studios or um, somebody that actually wants to run a small business out of them, um, they really are very flexible in their use, right? So um, we've got these four different things happening and then we finish with the retail in the corner that I described. As we go around clockwise to 35th Street, um, you can see that there's a more formal drop-off for our, for our uh, residents and for guests um, that come to the property. And then this yellow box that says lobby and, and amenity is uh, where you would enter the project from a residential standpoint. People could be dropped off or picked up at this location, access the building at grade at that location. The area in the middle, um, this exterior courtyard is really a hole in the building, if you will. And, and really what it is, is it allows um, residents to have an interior space that's a little more private, but really an outdoor space. And so that's almost like a park-like, a very quiet setting inside the building. As we continue around clockwise, one of the things that we worked hard on and, and is influenced by the form-based code is that there are no uh, curb cuts to the building on Beltline. So that's only a pedestrian experience um, as you move along the street. And, and then just on, on 35th Street, we have a one-way circulation moving around the project. Our entrance to our project and the access to the retail parking is all off this shared alley on the west side of the building. Yeah, right there, thank you. And, and really what that is, is it, it's there today. There's a curb cut there today. It's how you enter if you're going to Steel Toe or if you're going into the project. And the idea is that this becomes an access road for our residential, um, for our residents to come in with their cars and move into our parking garage, which is approximately three levels, three, 330 cars at that location. And if you continue further down, it gives you this access to this retail parking area for handicap parking for the retail and for others um, that becomes convenience parking, uh, which is important for any kind of retail that you would have, but it's not at the front door. It's not on Beltline. It's really trying to honor the streetscape and have all this happen back of house. 
It also provides some access for the building to our west for them to use that same shared alley. So we're really controlling the vehicular path of travel and focusing on the pedestrian as we've designed the, the layout of the project. Uh, let's go ahead and let's jump up to the upper level if I could, uh, the next level. So the way this building is designed, as, as Nick mentioned, is that it's a five-story accurate project. But what we've done is we've wanted to hide the garage. And so we've wrapped the garage with these units that are represented in blue. And so you don't see the garage from the street. And then we've also eroded the building down on this kind of Eastern edge where you see the yellow. And that's only a two-story building at that location. And really what that does is it creates an outdoor amenity space for the residents and gives them a great relationship to the preserve. And also kind of a see and be seen as you're walking along the street, you look up and you can see, um, you see things going on up there, trellises and people hanging out and, and really just having, um, again, the, the whole goal here is for Beltline to become a street that is activated in energy and um, just has a nice vibe to it, if I could use that word. Um, so the rest of this um, blue area you see are different types of units, the studios, ones and two and three bedroom units. And they're serviced off this corridor is this yellow line work that you see. And, and it's really shaped to break down the scale of the building. You can imagine that a parking structure is a fairly large form. So what can we do to break the scale down? And, and I think we've done a good job to take the building and, and shape it in a way that it has smaller pieces as you walk around it and move around it. Let's go ahead and go to the next image if we could. So there's a couple of views here that are what we call SketchUp views. They're a little simpler, but they do show the, the texture of the building and the shaping of the building. Let me start at the top. This is the view from the west side. Uh, so this is looking back towards, uh, from the preserve, back towards the project um, on the, the lower two-story live work um, is a brick and, and metal facade. And then the rest of the, the building that surrounds that is a combination of brick, metal panel, and some uh, cement board that is uh, colored. And then you'll see that two-story, if, if you could point to that, that amenity. So this is that amenity space that I described, inside fitness and club room. And then above that is actually the pool and active um, outdoor amenity space. And then as you come down to the next view, this is from the corner, let's say looking from the Southeast, looking back towards our entrance and back up Beltline towards the new transit stop. And you can see how we've broken the scale of the building down. And then as you move down below that, that's that formal experience, very you know U-shaped or C-shaped front door where the two towers come out and you, um, that's your arrival sequence for, for our project. And then lastly, um, what we're really excited about is this north end of this building. And this just real sort of sculpted end of the building where there's retail at the bottom and then there's some residences. And there's also a fifth floor amenity space for the residents up on top. So it erodes the building even further to break down the scale and really blend it into the landscape at that location. I think the last thing we have here is just a rendering of the overall project that you saw on the face page. And here you can really see how the building just feels as an overall composition. Um, keep in mind that the two-story amenity um, is a roof with the pool. And then beyond that, what you're seeing is actually the units behind that are screening the garage. So that's a big hole in the building that um, I don't think the rendering really represents it as accurately as we're gonna see it because we're elevated, right? We're looking at the building at a higher elevation um, and just this idea that the building scale has been broken down. So that's a quick overview of, of the, um, the architecture and how we laid out the project. We wanna leave time for questions and answers. So um, I'll stop there and, and we'll just um, allow Jennifer to, to uh, take it from here. Yeah, sure. thank, thank you, Dean. That was perfect, I appreciate it. And I just wanna echo everything that Dean said. You know, it's been great working with the city uh, thus far and we're, very excited about the project and excited for the process. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, going forward, this is the neighborhood meeting held by the developer. Uh, the formal process will begin on June 2nd where the planning commission will hold a public hearing. So anyone who has any comments uh, are welcome to 
join into that virtual meeting, there will be links posted on the website. You can also call in. If anyone has any comments that they would like to submit in writing, please feel free to email me. My email is posted on the city's website. And then if um, someone could share it in the chat, it's jmonson, J-M-O-N-S-O-N at stlewispark.org. Please feel free to email me or write me any comments that you might have. Um, and then after the public hearing and planning commission will review the development concept and make a recommendation to city council. Um, and then city council, there's actually um, two applications that the planning commission will be reviewing. They'll be reviewing applications for a preliminary and final plat, as well as a preliminary and final plan unit development. And then those will be forwarded on to the city council and city council will be reviewing three applications. They'll be reviewing the plat application, the planned unit development application. And then there's also an existing slope easement along Beltline Boulevard that was established when Beltline Boulevard was constructed. Uh, and there's a request to vacate that easement. And so a second public hearing will be held by the city council probably on June 21st. That's the tentative scheduled date at the moment. Um, and they will review all of the applications at that night. And then uh, because there is our two ordinances as part of this application process, there will also be a second reading of those ordinances and they are scheduled to go to city council on July 6th, I believe is the correct date. But all of that information will be posted on the city's website as well as call-in numbers. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you, Council Member Dubalog for joining us tonight as well. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to say before we open up the questions and answers or questions and comments, but. Just want to say thank you for joining us. Yeah, and I also want to recognize Councilmember Rog, who is um, my neighbor to the north. She's also on as well. Um, but I will let um, I will let uh, well if, if Councilmember Rog has any questions, I'll let her ask them right now. Sure. Yeah, I do actually have a couple questions. Thank you, Councilmember Dumlag. Um, so some of them are little and some of them are, uh, most of them are little questions, but on the, uh, first of all, thank you for the um, presentation and all the images. They really help to understand what this development um, could be if approved by city council. Um, and on the, um, is it, can everybody hear me? And am I, yep. well, okay. Good. Um, so you talked about the, the, the patio or the outdoor space. And actually, once I look back at my notes, I wasn't sure I understood that correctly. Is that going to be open to the public, did you mention, or just for residents? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Councilman Arag. That is uh, intended, the patio, which uh, sits adjacent to the retail space, is intended to be for the, uh, the commercial space that sits adjacent to it. So the, uh, the idea is, is that services the retail space. We are uh, looking at this green space here and thinking about what kind of public amenities we could have adjacent to the dog park as well. Um, kind of as, as uh, Dean mentioned, we'd love to keep the, as much green space on this hard corner as possible. Sure. So kind of like a, maybe a restaurant with an outdoor patio or something like that. Yeah, that's that's the thought. OK. And so um, it's early, very early, and you don't have a vendor, and all these things could change. And um, when we think about outdoor patio spaces, and as you mentioned, the recent, the pandemic, it's not recent, we're still in it, um, encourage that to be a year round kind of space, right? So heated. Uh, I think as we move into the future, we need to be thinking about our spaces as, um, uh, you, you know, usable year round outdoors, like they do in Norway and other places. Absolutely. That's something that we're really excited about is how can we integrate the patio into a kind of indoor outdoor space and space that can be used year round. And, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of places are looking at, you know, is it kind of an overhang with a garage door or what, which ways are, can we make it all function year round and we'd love to see that as well. Yeah. Heated, et cetera. So as you know, there is a beloved and probably the most popular gathering spot in the community for at least a certain sector of the community, which is Steel Toe Brewing right behind you. Right. And yeah, and I appreciate the efforts to hide the parking structure within the residential units and also know that Steel Toe is not in that, this, you know, does not have that benefit and wonder if there's anything you can say about a new five-story parking structure and actually maybe to Jennifer shadowing concerns or anything around the impact of 
of this five-story parking structure right next to or very near to um, Steel Toe Brewing. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that. So um, we recognize that this the parking structure are actually only three levels. So it'll only be about a two and a half story building because mm -hmm. um, you don't have to build it high enough to meet all the demand. Mm -hmm. That said, we're looking at that facade. We're studying that facade and figuring out how to treat it in a special way. The, the site depth just does not allow us to do all the things and put another layer of housing on that side. So really our best opportunity is to look at that facade and, and how do we treat it as, think of it maybe as um, art as architecture or architecture as art, mm -hmm. where we can do something that it becomes um, a proper visual experience, recognizing that we have to have the garage on that line, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I look forward to seeing more detail on that going Me forward. Too. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of the 330 parking spots, right, Correct. is that, and 250 units, is that matching up with the required parking? Is it more than required? It feels like more, but I don't know what your, you know, combination of unit size. You want to take that one, Nick, or I can? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're above uh, the current requirement, I believe, we did on our last uh, count of 250 units and 330 stalls. Um, I can I can take that too, Councilmember Rog. They exactly meet the city's parking requirements for the site. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. And then my last um, my last question. I'll reserve my comments for another time. But my last question is about um, uh, information available to the public on the website. It. I realize we're in the very early stage at this point, and I know that people like to get information as early as possible, especially if there's going, this is going to be coming before council, you know, within the next month. Jennifer, is this, perhaps this information is already available on the city's website? Yes. It is already on there. Yes. I have not checked, so thank you. Um, and then, okay, I guess I have one final question, which is around um, businesses that will be displaced by this. Um, Development. I know that Kenwood Gymnastics is looking at the roller garden. Everybody knows that. And that's interesting and sad and exciting at the same time because we love the roller garden. Um, but are there other, um, I can't recall, I, you know, this is Lynette's word, but are there other businesses that are going to be, I'm sure there are, who are going to be displaced and how, what is, are there any plans or efforts underway to assist them in finding and staying in business? Or how, how is that all working? Maybe Jennifer, that's to you or mm -hmm. Nick. Sure, I, I can touch on the existing uh, the existing tenants that are in these buildings today. Uh, all, all were basically on uh, either leases that were expiring this year or uh, went into leases that uh, were month to month. So they've all uh, begun to look at new spaces and uh, there are still a, a handful of small users who are still on month to month and will be until we uh, eventually close on the property. but. They are all beginning to look for new spaces. Okay. Well, I would encourage you, if possible, you know, to look at um, if any of those businesses are interested in um, relocating to your new, uh, your your newly refurbished spaces, retail opportunities going forward. That might be. I believe that. Um, oh gosh, my my tired brain's not working right now. But the, uh, over by uh, three ninety four, there was some participation in helping um, this. Anyway, it, it'd be, oh no, actually right there on 36th Street, right, Jennifer? There's an effort to you know help some of those existing businesses reopen in the new refurbished spaces in their same location. Right, right, that's correct. Yeah, so hopefully if folks are interested in that, that's an option for them. And, you know, we have been working with some of the businesses in the area. We worked pretty closely with Kenwood, Gymna Kenwood Gymnastics and tried to find them a right location. And it just so worked out that the uh, roller garden found, decided it was time that their owners retired. And it was a good opportunity for that use to yeah. be re relocated in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. Well, th those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a few members from the public here. I don't know if anyone has any questions or if anyone has sent any questions in the chat box. I 
I don't see any questions in the chat box. And I did share your um, email there, Jennifer, but I think um, Opus folks, I think it just went to you. I'm not sure that it was able to be yeah. sent to. It's limited to who gets the questions I've noticed on the chat. Okay. So whoever is, whoever is monitoring the chat from Opus's side, there might be some questions there. Yeah. There are 16 people on the call. I don't know if that, that probably suggests there are community members on the call too, right? Looks like I can see everyone's comments and I don't have any comments in my chat. Well, if there are no other questions from from the public, I, I got a few, so uh, I'll just shoot, I'll just ask them. Um, so you know, in the project, it's uh, was it two hundred and fifty units, ten percent at fifty percent AMI. Was there uh, a reason for that ratio, or to hit fifty percent AMI versus the other AMIs that we have part of our inclusionary housing policy? Sure. We, yeah, we looked at kind of the two options of the 10% at 50 or 20 at 60, I believe it is, and uh, ultimately landed on the 10% at 50, and we uh, started to look at what we could make work with uh, the site constraints as well as uh, economic space. Okay. And then a uh, part of your live work units, is that would that be counted as part of the AMI, or is it dispersed? Like, what is the, the bedroom count, I should say? for the affordable units at 50% AMI? Um, I, I don't know the bedroom count offhand, but I know that as part of that, we have to have an even amounts from each unit type. So we do have, uh, you know, there's only six total live work units, but one of those would be uh, qualified. Uh, so there's a percentage of each unit type that has to meet that. And oh, okay, got it, okay. So then um, the, so thanks, Darren. I think you answered the, the parking structure question that I had. Um, and going off of Councilmember Rogg's comment about making parking structures interesting, I think of uh, Mono in, in Uptown and how they have that green wall um, as kind of an example. And you know, we're, you're right by the preserve. So something imaginative would, um, I, I would be interested in seeing something that imaginative uh, applied to the parking structure. Cool. Uh, Councilman Dumoulin, I, uh, it's funny because um, I went over there a week or so ago and sat in that um, space outdoors and had a pint and looked up and went, we have to do something there. Because yeah. all of a sudden I'm looking at the building, I'm imagining the building in my brain and I'm like, oh my goodness, there's a great opportunity there. Uh, to do something and, and not have housing looking at a parking lot, but actually have something for that the, that merchant to look at, right? And that's our opportunity. Yeah. Even like the, um, is it parking ramp B? I mean, obviously that's a very elaborate, like wind kind of, um, sure, sure. Kind of sculpture that was, yeah. If, just something a little bit to, to Council Member Rog's point, you know, the beloved steel toe, um, and, and others in the neighborhood that would benefit from kind of being in that area. So I know that there's utilities along that. Are you gonna, are these gonna be moved as part of this project? You're, okay, and then, yeah. okay. And I didn't mention that there's actually a, a sewer line running along 35th Street. That's why the building's pulled back so far. That's a 30 foot setback there. So we have this really beautiful green space that's gonna be created. Um, along mm. our building edge because we can't build over top of that um, large sewer line. So that's kind of a nice streetscape, I think, too. Yeah, because because you have to. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but what's so the benefit, the, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great thinking on our part. Um, so then the retail spaces, how big are those two, two separate spaces? 2200 on the smaller one and 50, these are round numbers, right? 5,500 yep. on the larger one. The, the smaller one is really thought of as more of kind of a service retail or maybe a professional retail. And then but as we spoke that we really see this larger space as being um, a, a restaurant space with this mm -hmm. indoor outdoor environment. Okay. And then, you know, generally speaking, I haven't kept in like up to date on what the vacancy rates are for market rates. 
um, a part like this type of um, you know development? What generally speaking, what is the vacancy rate or um, that that you guys are seeing um, in a first ring suburb? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd say it's pretty consistently five percent across the board. Maybe maybe with all things considered, it crept up a little bit higher. You know, in Minneapolis and in the first ring suburbs, it was maybe five to seven, but we're still seeing you know, fairly low rates. Uh, we've kind of seen these things pick up in general across the board and we've seen some really positive trends uh, call it for the last six months or so. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, here probably four to five percent. Okay. And then for, um, you know, kind of that mixed income type of development, I, I'm, I'm not familiar if Opus, and, and I'm assuming you guys have had kind of track records with doing that and, and lease up of that. And and I'm not sure, do you, you don't do third party, do you do third party management with we your- We will be hiring a third party uh, management group for this project. Um, okay. The, uh, most of our more recent projects have been in Minneapolis. Uh, the last couple of years and uh, did not have an affordability component or inclusionary component, uh, but uh, across the country, we do have projects where we've had that. Okay. And then have you selected who your um, like third party, I mean, are you in discussions with a third party management um, firm? Yeah, we're talking to a couple of groups. Uh, we, we're talking to uh, Greco. Uh, we're talking to uh, what is now Lincoln, which used to be the Excelsior group. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll likely talk to a couple other groups. We probably won't make that selection for another, well, I'd say probably another month or two. Okay, okay. And then how? Do, what are your expectations on lease up um, for this particular project? Um, 250 units, I would say probably about 18 months, give or take. Um, I'd, I'd say, yeah, 16 to 18 months is probably our realistic lease up. Okay, and then, you know, I, I, how, how do you, you know, for the folks that are looking for the for, for getting the affordability piece, how do they find how do they find you? Like, how do they know that they just stumble upon you, or like, is there like a do you, I mean, do you work with a certain vendor that helps identify some affordable units? How does that work? Sure, and and a lot of that does fall to to our our, uh, our ultimately our, who our operations team is and, and you know how we market the building and. Uh, getting that out there, but uh, that would be on the website. It would, you know, in a Google search, and that uh, would be readily accessible. That that it's known that we have those uh, those units available. Okay, Councilmember Dumalong, this is Jennifer Monson, Senior Planner. Um, the city also does a really good job of keeping track and updating our website of all affordable units in the city of St. Louis Park. Um, so whenever we know a new development such as this might be coming online in the next few years, we post that information as soon as possible. Um, and actually, I've, I've received a number of emails and phone calls from people looking for affordable units in the area, and they have found our affordability housing map very helpful. So um, it's yeah been a really great resource for people looking for those units. Great. And when is your anticipated um, construction uh, commencement and anticipated completion? Sure. Um, we're hoping uh, to be in the ground, I would say, kind of towards the end of this year, we'll, we'll be running through the city process as well as the TIP process uh, that will likely bring us to, I would say, fall of this year. So uh, the hope is that we're in the ground, uh, ideally September, and uh, it'll be about a about a two-year construction period. I'm sorry, did you say two-year construction period? Yes. Okay, okay. great. Um, those are the only questions I had, I think, at this time. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. I see a number of, sorry, I'm just jumping in. I didn't even get called on. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I'm, I'm used to the mayor saying to your turn. Um, anyway, uh, so I do see a number of uh, residents on the call, looks like, and I just, I'm surprised that there aren't any questions at all. Are we sure that people are able to be in touch? Yeah, okay. We do have a fairly heavy focus presence as well on the call, uh, just as an FYI, but uh, it does appear that the chat is working. Okay. So far we do have All right, thanks. Um, and then I do have a, one more just follow-up kind of comment, if it's all right. So we um, we talked about, or there was, a, we, there was an allusion that we alluded to the 
two options around affordability. One is 10, you know, requirement in the city and one is 10% at 50% at 50% and the other is 20% at 60%. And I want to note that there is an additional option, which is 5% at 30% and, um, or, and I believe any, and or any combination thereof. So, um, you know, affordability for me personally, and at least for some of my colleagues is a pretty big deal in the community. And so, you know, 25 units, um, I don't want to editorialize here, but 25 units is what it is out of 250. And I'll be curious to see what the TIF request is, you know, going forward. And and uh, and I'm not going to ask about that right now. I think it's too early. But uh, just you know, affordability is important in here in this community, and we have a lot of uh, market rate apartments. So the the more you can do in that area, I think the the better we'll feel as a council and the community. Any other questions, comments? Check the chat one more time. Wonderful. Well, thanks. We've heard from everybody and wanted to say thank you again to everybody who joined and uh, for those who uh, watch it later from the recording, I look forward to uh, additional comments or questions, and we'll continue to work through the city process. And if there's anything that comes up along the way, uh, please let us know. Yes, thank, thank you me. very much for the time and the comments. I'm sorry, it looks like somebody is just joining. Just want to make sure that we capture. Sure. I think. I just, I heard a doorbell, so. We can, we can give it another minute, no worries. Yeah, sorry. I think it was Claudia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Claudia, we're calling you out. Did you have any questions? I guess that's a no. Uh, we will uh, make sure that we uh, get this recording over uh, as well, Jennifer, so that it can be posted. And uh, as I said, if there's any questions along the way, please do let us know. Sounds perfect. And I will put, Nick, I will post your contact information on the website as well. And if anyone has questions, they can contact you, they can contact me, and we'll make sure to get any questions answered. Wonderful. Great. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for the time. Have a wonderful Appreciate night. It. Thank Have you.